नमस्कार अ वॉर्म वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एन इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज नवनीता अधिकारी एंड विद मी इज मनोज सिंह राणा ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेज ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaks to his Hungarian counterpart Viktor Orbán on phone. Appreciates Hungary's role in the evacuation of over 6000 Indian citizens through the Ukraine-Hungary border. India moves out all Indian students from Sumy, Ukraine. Australian Army Chief exchange views with top leadership of Indian Armed Forces on current global situation including Indo-Pacific and measures for enhancing defense ties. All arrangements in place for counting of votes for assembly elections in Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Punjab, Goa and Manipur on Thursday. Indian cabinet approves establishment of WHO, Global Center for Traditional Medicine in Gujarat, and an ICC Women's World Cup, India to take on hosts New Zealand at Hamilton on Thursday. As we start the bulletin we appeal to our listeners to stay safe from covid-19 by following these four simple steps get fully vaccinated wear a face mask maintain 2 gaz ki doori for social distancing focus on hand and face hygiene and now the news in detail Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi on Wednesday had a telephonic conversation with his Hungarian counterpart Viktor Orbán. The two leaders discussed the ongoing situation in Ukraine and agreed on the need to ensure an immediate ceasefire and a return to diplomacy and dialogue. Mr Modi conveyed his warm thanks to Mr Orbán and to the Hungarian government for facilitating the evacuation of more than 6000 Indian citizens through the Ukraine-Hungary border. Mr Orbán conveyed his best wishes to the Indian medical students evacuated from Ukraine and said that they could choose to continue their studies in Hungary if they wished. Mr Modi expressed his appreciation for this generous offer. The leaders agreed to remain in touch on the evolving situation and to continue their efforts to encourage an end to the conflict. India on Wednesday said that it has been able to move out all Indian students from Sumy, Ukraine. Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson Arindam Bakchi said they are currently en route to Poltava from where they will board trains to western Ukraine. He said flights under Operation Ganga are being prepared to bring them home. Indian ambassador to Ukraine on Wednesday flagged off special train with 600 Indian students from Sumy University at Lviv railway station. They will travel to Poland and are expected to board evacuation flights to India on Thursday. The last batch of Indian students has left the eastern Ukraine and is moving towards the western part. They will soon enter the neighboring countries and will be evacuated from there. This was stated by Union Minister Piyush Goyal while briefing the media in New Delhi along with Information and Broadcasting Minister Anurag Thakur. He said it is a matter of great pride for all to bring back more than 20,000 Indian nationals who were stranded in Ukraine within 3 weeks. Lauding the leadership of the Prime Minister Mr Goel said Mr Modi himself took this matter seriously and held eight high level meetings and talked to world leaders every possible use of diplomacy was done so that indian citizens could come back safely union minister goel said india evacuated citizens from nepal pakistan and bangladesh as well in today's hotspot section we bring you a discussion on operation ganga and beyond We are joined by Anil Kumar Trigunayat, former ambassador, and Manish Pratim Bhuyan, the journalist. So, Ambassador Trigunayat, uh, the evacuation has been undertaken within less than two weeks after uh, launching it. We titled it Operation Ganga from Ukraine. So how do you see the overall evacuation by India in the middle of a uh, raging war uh, do you think our active diplomatic engagement including by prime minister narendra modi uh, he held three phone phone conversations with russian president vladimir putin and two phone conversations with ukrainian president zelensky yeah well this is uh, again one of the most remarkable evacuation efforts that india has taken and uh, it has also brought back nearly every single indian student india has always been very successful in its evacuation i must say starting from iraq war 
Uh, we brought out more than 1 lakh people from Libya, Lebanon, Yemen. Yemen, we brought out people from 48 countries also. This time, of course, when the war is in, more difficult. Therefore, it's extremely important that at the highest leadership level, we communicate our concerns. And as you know, through the UN Security Council, in our bilateral discussions, President Zelensky and the President Putin, Prime Minister Modi often uh, spoke about the safety and security of the Indian citizen. And uh, the, that for its humanitarian corridors must be created, that there should be a ceasefire. And I think that helps. And India has, and Prime Minister Modi personally has, the very good relations with all these leaders. And I think they paid off a great dividend to us in this. Unfortunately, we lost one student uh, in the crossfire and the one other was hurt, but everybody has been brought back. And I think this is a remarkable success by any standard, not only because, I mean, you can see countries like US and UK, uh, I mean, there are 10 or 12 citizens were left, although they started months before uh, asking their people to leave, but they could not complete it. On the contrary, India is the only country who started off and ended it with a great success. Uh, what do you make of India's overall approach uh, towards the conflict? India did not side with any party and kept mm -hmm. calling for diffusing the crisis through dialogue and diplomacy. In his uh, telephonic conversation uh, with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi suggested that a direct conversation uh, uh, takes place between President Putin and President Zelensky, uh, saying that it may greatly assist in uh, peace efforts. And he hoped that the ongoing negotiations between the two sides would lead to cessation of conflict. Conflict. So in the midst of uh, our evacuation efforts, we also <clears throat> try to play a role in uh, diffusing the crisis, uh, notwithstanding uh, observations that we did not take uh, uh, a strong stand at the United Nations Security Council because we did not uh, side with uh, the other parties. Uh, so how do you see India's overall approach in handling uh, this situation? Well, I think that uh, the criticism coming from certain quarters is totally misplaced and divorced of any reality. India has to stand for India first. That is there. And India voted for India. At the same time, India voted for peace. India voted for dialogue. India voted for diplomacy. India voted for security of all concerned. India voted for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all, both the countries. Now, more than that, who can do what? Other parties are all interested parties. And today, I think that the stand that India has taken, and not only once, and I think that even if for a second, you remove this special relationship and privileged partnership India has with Russia, or with the comprehensive global strategic part partnership that we have with the Americans, or many other countries in Europe and elsewhere, even if you square them out, what does India stand for? India always stands for peace. India does not support external military interventions. And it has been clearly conveyed to the Russians and to everybody else. At the same time, India wanted peace in the region because that impacts everyone, including India itself. And therefore, Prime Minister Modi and the Indian stance has been absolutely correct. It is principled stand and nothing could have been better. And that is what gives India a greater moral authority today to be able to pick up the phone, talk to Putin, talk to Zelensky or talk to Biden or anybody else for that matter. So I think that India, anybody who's criticizing it, just for criticizing for the heck of it, because they tend to forget that what they did in Libya, what they did in Iraq was absolute disaster. And that's what has created much more uh, destabilization of the world than what we are seeing today, just because it is between Russia and Ukraine, and there this fits into their geopolitical games. India cannot be a party to it. Ambassador Triganayat, uh, you had uh, spent a significant uh, uh, number of years in the MEA, I mean, uh, heading India's uh, diplomatic missions in various countries. I would like to know, in fact, uh, your uh, actual analysis of the evacuation mission. You spoke about our evacuation from Yemen, our evacuation from Libya, our evacuation uh, mission from Kuwait uh, during the Gulf War. Uh, how this evacuation operation Ganga was different from the previous evacuation? Uh, because we have seen, in fact, a whole of the government approach, definitely that kind of approach must have been uh, implemented in previous evacuation missions also. But uh, under Operation Ganga, we have seen uh, various ministries, various wings of the government coming together, including Ministry of Defense was involved, Ministry of uh, Civil Aviation was involved, Ministry of External Affairs was actively coordinating all the effort. External Affairs Minister... Uh, uh, as Jai Shankar spoke to several leaders, uh, several prominent European leaders also. Our Foreign Secretary, uh, Harshbardhan Sringla, was in constant touch with Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine. 
so how do you see the overall uh, uh, evacuation mission uh, in comparison to India's previous, uh, you know, very famous evacuations uh, uh, from uh, countries that you just mentioned? Well, you know, like uh, the, the, this is an evolution. You know, every time that we try to, there is a situation broadly maybe similar, but when we are looking at situation in a country, it depends. Uh, on where do we spend? Like, for example, in Libya, we had to depend to a great extent for evacuation of people on the Libyan government while they were having the internal revolution. And uh, therefore, because you can only evacuate if you have an assistance and uh, the country is functioning and their military and other uh, security system uh, that should be able to help you evacuate your people. Like, in Iraq, in Iraq also the war was there, but at the same time with the help of Saddam Hussein's army and others, we were able to take out. Likewise, it is the same thing here. In this case, uh, we have been in touch with this, uh, with Zelensky and his ministers and everybody else, even though they wanted India to take a more critical approach towards Russia, but they understood. And today Zelensky himself asked Prime Minister Modi that please tell Putin to stop war and talk to me directly. Now, that is what is the diplomacy all about. And actually, we have a contingency plan. We have a war room in which defense, navy, air force, all big uh, and intelligence wings, everybody works in tandem with our foreign minister. It is located in the Ministry of External Affairs. And uh, we do it exactly the same way. We have we have our own, uh, I would say, standard operating procedure in this. And every embassy has its own contingency plan in which how they will evacuate. And so we always prepare for the worst case scenario. And that's why our missions have been far more successful in doing it. We also take the help of the community people uh, who are there. We take the help of the companies which are there. We take the help of the neighboring countries who are involved or are close by associated. So I think that this is a holistic effort by everybody. And therefore, and today, there is a bit of a difference uh, because at that time, we did not have social media, which was so prominent. Today, social media plays a very different role. Sometimes it creates fake narratives also. Fake news comes out. It causes a lot of worry and tension for the people. And sometimes uh, you have uh, the news traveling, right news traveling, so you are able to address and bring out people from those difficult situations. So this is also a challenge that has come up at this time. But I'm very happy that uh, we have been able to take out nearly every single Indian uh, out of the conflict zone in uh, Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Trigana, what would be the implications for India from this crisis in Ukraine? Uh, uh, what kind of implications do you see, in fact, economic implications for India or implications for supply of military hardware from Russia to India? What kind of implications uh, you think we may have from this crisis in Ukraine? Well, in the short term, uh, there will immediately be crisis that we all are seeing, and that is on the high prices of oil. And that is going to impact everybody, including the citizens, oil companies. Uh, and second is, we will have to watch the financial impact of the sanctions placed on the Russia, because we also have a lot of different deals with Russians. We have been doing S-400 and others. And if the Americans are foolhardy enough to invoke those sanctions against uh, third or second countries like Pakistan and others, uh, then it will have a geoeconomic and geopolitical issues that will come out. And at that point, India will have to also look at this. But at the same time, as far as our trade with Russia is concerned or with other countries are concerned, we are also developing alternative mechanisms. Because India does not believe in using that, even though whosoever would. We, we would prefer them not to be there. We would prefer there is no war. We would like that to be the peace there. And so today, India can emerge as a good interlocutor in that. Of course, we will have economic impact uh, because just the world was coming out of the pandemic and then we have this war, uh, which will have geoeconomic implications for uh, for the whole world, really. Uh, Mr. Trigonath, uh, thank you so very much for your detailed perspective about uh, India's evacuation mission operation. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. External Affairs Minister of India Dr. S. Jay Shankar had a conversation with Italian Foreign Minister Luigi Di Meo on the Ukraine situation. Both the ministers on Wednesday reaffirmed the importance of an early ceasefire and returned to dialogue and diplomacy. 
Australian Army Chief Lieutenant General Richard Maxwell Burr along with a four member delegation is on a four day visit to India. He called on Army Chief, Navy Chief, Air Force Chief and other senior military officers. The Defence Ministry said interaction between both the chiefs of the army staff was warm and cordial. Both chiefs exchanged views on the current global situation and the situation in the Indo-Pacific in addition to discussing measures for enhancing defense cooperation between both armies. The visiting army chief also addressed the faculty and participants of the prestigious National Defense College. He also interacted on regional security perspectives with the vice chief of army and the director at Center for Land Warfare Studies, New Delhi. Lieutenant General Burr will be visiting Indian Army formations and units deployed along western borders on Thursday. Foreign ministers of Ukraine and Russia scheduled to meet in Turkey most likely on Thursday according to new agency reports. The talks will be held in a trilateral format with Turkey opting to mediate between both nations in Antalya in southern Turkey. Russian Foreign Minister Sergey Lavrov is likely to meet his Ukrainian counterpart Dmitry Kuleba after the third round of negotiations between their countries ended on Tuesday without any solution. In Ukraine, the besieged Azov city port, uh, sea port city of Mariupol has seen some of the most desperate scenes of war, with civilians struggling without water, heat, basic sanitation or phones for several days. With water supplies cut, people have been collecting water from streams or melting snow. The representatives of Ukraine's Red Cross are trying to deliver first aid to those who need it the most, but resources are scarce. Alexei Bertsev, head of the Red Cross of Mariupol, said that there is no supply of electricity, water or gas. People took shelter in underground basements, anxiously waiting for news of evacuation efforts. Bertsev added that many residents have lost internet access following power cut and now rely on their car radios for information. They are compelled to listen to news which are broadcast from areas controlled by Russian or Russian-backed separatist forces. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that efforts were underway to evacuate some 18,000 people from the capital, Kiev, and embattled towns near it. He said that the efforts are part of broader evacuation attempts by multiple humanitarian corridors within Ukraine and warned Russian forces against violating ceasefire promises. Asking for foreign air support, President Zelensky on Wednesday said that Western powers have sent military equipment and beefed up forces on Ukraine's eastern flank but have been wary of providing air support and getting drawn into a direct war with Russia. New Zealand lawmakers have unanimously passed a bill to impose economic sanctions on Russia. Unlike many countries that had already imposed sanctions, New Zealand's laws didn't previously allow it to apply meaningful measures unless they were part of a broader United Nations effort. Because Russia has UN Security Council veto power that had left New Zealand hamstrung. The new law, which was imposed in a single day, targets those in Russia associated with the military operations, including oligarchs. It will allow New Zealand to freeze assets and stop super yachts or plane from arriving. Minister of International Trade, Export Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development of Canada, Mary NG will arrive in New Delhi on Thursday on a four-day visit. Ms. Mary NG and Commerce and Industry Minister Piyush Goyal will co-chair the 5th India-Canada Ministerial Dialogue on Trade and Investment. During the meeting, various bilateral trade and investment issues will be discussed in order to further strengthen the bilateral ties and economic partnership, including the India-Canada Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. The total bilateral trade, including goods and services, crossed $11 billion. China has said that the 15th round of military commander-level talks with India on the border issue will be held on the 11th of March and hope that both sides can make a further step forward in resolving the remaining friction areas in eastern Ladakh border. At the daily media briefing in Beijing, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian expressed hope that the two sides can reach a proper settlement of the disputes and the upcoming talks 
and reach a solution that is acceptable to both the sides. He told the media that in the last round of talks, the two sides had candid, in-depth exchange of views on resolving the remaining issues on the western sector of the boundary. The 14th round of border talks was held on January the 12th without any fresh breakthrough. China on Wednesday said it welcomes Ms. Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, to visit China, including Xinjiang in May. UN Human Rights Council chief announced her much-awaited visit to China in May, including Xinjiang, where Beijing has been accused of committing human rights violations against Uyghur Muslims. The UN's top human rights official had been negotiating with Beijing's, Beijing since September 2018 about a visit to Xinjiang, where over a million, mainly Uyghur Muslims, are alleged to have been held in mass detention camps. According to media reports, an agreement is set to include unfettered access to a broad range of people. All necessary preparations have been made in states of Goa, Manipur, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand for the counting of votes for legislative assemblies on Thursday. The counting process will begin at 8 in the morning. The counting trends and results will be available on the Election Commission website and will be updated every few minutes to display the current round-wise trends and results of each constituency. The trends and results will also be accessible through the Voter Helpline mobile app. In Uttar Pradesh, assembly elections for 403 seats were held in seven phases from the 10th of February to the 7th of March. In Uttarakhand, the counting of votes for all 70 assembly seats took place and for which polling held in single phase on the 14th of February. Polling for Punjab Assembly elections were held in a single phase on the 20th of February. The counting of votes will take place for 117 seats at 66 locations in the state. In Goa, polling was held in 40 Assembly constituencies in a single phase on the 14th of February. Manipur witnessed the elections in two phases for the 60-member Legislative Assembly. Meanwhile, the Election Commission has said that 670 counting observers... 130 police observers and 10 special observers will be on ground to ensure smooth counting. Briefing the media in New Delhi, Deputy Election Commissioner Chandra Bhushan Kumar said an elaborate and foolproof arrangements have been made at all the counting centres. Mr Kumar said all strong rooms where EVMs have been kept are under three-layer security with inner cordon armed by the Central Armed Police Forces. He said concerned candidates have been watching strong room arrangements through CCTV coverage 24 by 7. Indian Cabinet has approved the establishment of the WHO Global Centre for Traditional Medicine at Jamnagar in Gujarat, the western part of the country. It will be the first and only global outposted centre for traditional medicine across the globe. It will be established under the Ministry of Ayush. It will ensure quality, safety and efficacy, accessibility and rational use of traditional medicine and work to develop norms, standards and guidelines in relevant technical areas, tools and methodologies for collecting data, undertaking analytics and access impact. The 12th edition of the Bangalore India Nano Conference is dwelling on subjects ranging from nanomedicine, nanophotonics, nanotextile to hydrogen technology. It has virtual participation from over 10 countries including Israel, Japan and Germany. The conference kick-started on Tuesday. The Academia, industry experts, entrepreneurs and startups have come on one platform. There are 75 eminent speakers, 2,500 delegates and over 4,000 attendees participating in 25 sessions. During the award function, Director of Center for Nanotechnology and Advanced Biomaterials, Dr. S. Swaminathan was conferred with the Dr. C.N.R. Rao Sponsored Award. Dr. Swaminathan informed that nanotechnology-based treatment is being developed to treat cardiac ailments. The Sensex and the Nifty today surged more than 2%. Both stocks jumped amid mixed cues from the global share markets. The BSE Sensex finished above 54,600 points, while the NSC Nifty ended near 16,350 level, a report from the business world. 
The Sensex rose 1,223 points or 2.29% to trade at 54,647. The Nifty gained 332 points or 2.07% to trade at 16,345. Among global markets, Southeast Asian stocks declined except Singapore's Straits Times, which ended 1.5% up. Asian equity indices slipped following overnight fall in the U.S. share markets. China's Shanghai Composite Index lost 1.1%, Hong Kong's Hang Seng plunged 0.7%, and Japan's Nikkei 225 tumbled 0.3%. Oil prices declined around 3%, even as the United States banned Russian oil imports. In intraday trade, Brent crude was trading around $124.40 per barrel in a highly volatile trade. Anubha Rohatki for World News, All India Radio. In the ICC Women's World Cup, India will take on New Zealand at the Seddon Park in Hamilton on Thursday. The match will begin at 6.30 a.m. according to the Indian time. India will look to build on the winning momentum in their second tournament match after clinching the first match against arch-rival Pakistan by 107 runs. Prasad Bharti is covering this month-long 2022 ICC Women's Cricket World Cup live through radio commentary. And now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Let us take a look at the press reports on China. Hindustan Times and other news outlets have prominently carried the news that India and China are set to hold the 15th round of military talks on March the 11th to ease tensions in Ladakh. The dialogue is expected to focus on resolving outstanding issues at the remaining friction points along the line of actual control. Officials familiar with the development said... News 18 headlines, Wang Yi's message on India-China ties signals shift in tone and India must tread cautiously. Bloomberg reports that China accused the U.S. military of operating dangerous biolabs in Ukraine, echoing a Russian conspiracy theory that Western officials warned could be part of an effort to justify Russian invasion after the fact. Let us take a look at what made the headlines in Nepal. Khabar Hub reports that Nepali Congress is gearing up for upcoming local elections with a press conference by the Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deoba at the Central Party headquarters in Sanepa. The local level election is being held on May 13th. The Kathmandu Post headlines reads, Nepal and US AID are set to sign $659 million deal for five years. The grant will be spent on such sectors as education, health and economic growth. Let us have some brief news from Afghanistan. The Hindu has carried an exclusive interview with former Afghan President Hamid Karzai. It quotes him saying that India should re- reopen its embassy in Kabul and re-engage with Afghanistan and its de facto government. He is one of the few Afghan leaders who chose to stay back despite the Taliban takeover of the country. Tolo News writes that residents and local officials said that a clash erupted between the Islamic Emirates border forces and Iranian border guards in Kang district of Nimroz province on Monday evening. Let us have some brief news from Bangladesh. The crew members of Bangladeshi freed ship Banglar Shomriddhi stranded in Ukraine returned to Dhaka on Wednesday. Dhaka Tribune reports that the 28 crew members arrived in Dhaka from Turkey from Romania after being evacuated from Ukraine. A quick look at the headlines once again. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaks to his Hungarian counterpart Viktor Orban on phone, appreciates Hungary's role in the evacuation of over 6,000 Indian citizens through the Ukraine-Hungary border. India moves out all Indian students from Sumi, Ukraine. Australian Army Chief exchange views with top leadership of Indian Armed Forces on current global situation, including Indo-Pacific and measures for enhancing defence ties. All arrangements in place for counting of votes for assembly elections in Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Punjab, Goa and Manipur on Thursday. Indian Cabinet approves establishment of WHO Global Centre for Traditional Medicine in Gujarat. And in ICC Women's World Cup, India to take on hosts New Zealand at Hamilton on Thursday. And now before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favourite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by artists from Cuba.
and with that we end this bulletin we'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of world news Thank you.